We are in week three of our series called We Want to See Jesus. And what we're doing is we're walking through the Old Testament scriptures, seeing Jesus there. Whether he's prophesied about, foreshadowed, or whether he's actually there in the Old Testament as the pre-incarnate Christ because he's eternal. He's been around forever. He is the God of gods, the King of kings, the eternal Lord who's been there. And he's inserted himself into his, human history uh, time and time again. What we've seen uh, is Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3.15. Uh, they sinned by eating the fruit that God told them not to eat from. And ever since then, humanity has been plunged into sin. And because of their sin, death has been brought into the world. And yet God didn't turn his back on humanity. Instead, what did he do? He promised the Savior to come and crush the serpent's head. To come and undo everything that the devil had done. A, a Savior was coming from the woman's line. Thousands of years later, 2000 B.C., we looked at last week, Abram, who was later known as Abraham, God promised to him that all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. We learn that the, the Messiah, the coming Savior, would be both a Jew, because Abraham was a Jew, so from, the, from Abram's line, he was going to be a Jew, but he would also bless all peoples. Not just the Jewish family line, but everyone. Today we jump 500 years later, 1500 B.C., and we look at Moses in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, real quick, let me just give you the, the history of the Israelites, uh, the Jewish people. Abram, Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons that were known as the sons of Israel, so the Israelites. The Israelites left the land of Canaan to move to Egypt because of a, of a severe famine, and that's where they made their home for over 400 years. Over the course of 400 years, they went from about 100 people to 2 million people. Uh, while living in Egypt. And the Egyptians looked and said, you know what? This is a big group of people. They might be powerful. We better enslave them. And so that's what they did. They enslaved the, the Israelites. And for uh, a number of years, all the Israelites did was wake up and make bricks for the Egyptians. They'd go and get the straw. They'd make the cement and everything needed to make bricks. That was their day. From the moment they woke up to the moment they went to bed, seven days a week, brick making. Imagine that lifestyle. When you're eight years old, thinking of what you're going to be when you get older, there was no, I want to be a shepherd, I want to be this. No, 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 you're going to be a brick maker. That's what you're going to be. I'd like to take a vacation. There's no vacation. I'd like to take a break. You get beat by your taskmaster, your slave master. You get out of line. You get beat by your slave master. You start working at a young age, and you don't stop working until your body stops working, and you can no longer make bricks. You live in fear. You live with despair. You live with no hope, no peace, you live with this existence of a slave. And this for, was for hundreds of years. And they cried out to the Lord, deliver us, free us. And then a baby was born, whose name was Moses. And Moses was adopted by Pharaoh, king of Egypt's daughter. And Moses, who was a Jew, was raised in the household of the king. And when he was 80 years old, God called Moses and said, I'm going to set my people free. I'm going to deliver them from their slavery, and you are going to lead them. Go to Pharaoh and tell them to, tell them to let my people go. But he didn't. He was stubborn. Not Moses, the Pharaoh. And so what God did was he sent nine plagues against the Egyptians. Plagues like turning water into blood, plagues of boils on all the people, frogs, gnats, flies, 
uh, everywhere. Nine of them. And during each one, Pharaoh said, if you pray to God to, to stop this plague, I will let my, I'll let your people go. Moses prayed. Pharaoh changed his mind and hardened his heart and said, who's the Lord that I should listen to him? And so finally, God was coming to bring judgment. Judgment against stubbornness, judgment against pride, judgment against rejection of the Lord. He was coming to judge sin, to deliver his people and free them. In chapter 12, God prepares his people for freedom. He prepares his people for the coming judgment over sin. And that's what we're going to look at today. Exodus chapter 12. Here's what we're told. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the, the number of people there, there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they, are, where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I will see the blood. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. God was coming to bring judgment over sin. And he was going to pass through the land and judge and bring death to the firstborns of Egypt. How were the Israelites supposed to avoid this? God tells them. Uh, he says, this is going to be new. This is a new life, a new freedom. What I'm bringing you into is going to be a brand new life of freedom and joy. And so this month, God said, this is your first month of your year. Brand new. It was the month of Abib, and on the 10th day, which is our April, on the 10th day, Israelites, you are to select a lamb or a goat, one for your household, one per household. Bring it in on the 10th day. It's supposed to be one year old, one year old, without blemish, without defect, not blind, not lame, not spotted. It's supposed to be a perfect looking lamb or goat, one year old, and you bring it into your household. And you're supposed to hang on to it for four days. Do you know what that had to do for those kids? How many of you have pets? Anybody a foster pet parent? No? Okay. Any of you, did any of you, when you got your dog or cat, did you have a trial period at home where you brought it home to see if it would be a good fit? We did that as a kid one time. We, we had a, my mom brought home a, a little tiny dachshund and, uh, to see if, we, if it would make a good fit in our household when we were little kids. Uh, and it was only there a few hours. But guess what happens just after a few hours? We become attached. <laughs> little kids become attached to those pets, and all they want is to hold on to them. And when mom had to take that dog back, oh, there were tears. <laughs> and that was just after a few hours. Now imagine bringing this goat or lamb into your household for four days, feeding it, caring for it, loving on it, and then on the fourth night at twilight, dad goes out and slaughters it. Not return it home, 
but slaughters it. Do you think that the kids were standing there saying, Dad, don't. Dad, please no. And yet that's what he had to do. He slaughtered it and then put the blood of the lamb or goat on the door frame. And then they were to barbecue it over fire and then eat it with bitter herbs and bread without yeast. Eat it in haste and get into the house. It's the Lord's Passover. Why? Because God was coming to bring judgment over sin. And as those kids yelled out, Dad, no, don't. What does the dad say? He looks at the firstborn son and says, Son, it's either you or this goat. It's either you or this lamb. God is bringing judgment over sin. And he's freeing us from the slavery to the Egyptians. But it's you or the goat or lamb. And so we're going to sacrifice it. And God said in, chapter 13, or in verse 13, when he sees the blood on the doorframe, he will pass over the house. And no destructive plague will touch you. You see, if the people wanted to be freed from their slavery, this is how it was going to be. It's your first point today. The blood of the Lamb will set people free from Egypt's darkness and death. God was bringing judgment, and if they wanted to be freed from Egypt's darkness and death that came through the Egyptians, their slavery to the Egyptians, it would be this way. God brought judgment over sin, and the blood of the Lamb on the door frames protected the people inside the house. And after God went through, he would lead them to the freedom that they desired, the freedom to worship God freely, the hope that freedom brings, the peace that freedom brings, the purpose that freedom brings, going to the land of Canaan, the promised land that God had promised their ancestors. It only could happen through freedom from the Egyptians, and God was bringing it as he brought judgment over sin against the Egyptians. And how did they avoid the judgment? The blood of the Lamb. And this is exactly what happened. At the end of the chapter, we hear that God went through the land of Egypt, and there was not a single house in Egypt that didn't have someone dead. There was wailing, there was crying in all of Egypt. But in Israel, there wasn't a single peep because everyone was protected by the blood of the Lamb. So what are we to make of all this? What is God teaching the people? What is God teaching us living 2,000, well, 3,500 years after this event? You see, God could have just gone through Egypt and just did what he did without needing the blood of the Lamb, right? He could have, except he's teaching the people that there's a much deeper slavery, a much more evasive slavery. It's not slavery to a nation, it's slavery to sin. And that has affected every single person since Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Ever since then, humanity has been plunged into slavery to sin. You see, sin is, yes, active. Sin is something that I do, I say, I think, and it's my fault. I do it. I'm not a victim. But at the same time, we're also slaves to sin. And we see the effects of slavery to sin in our lives and in the people's lives around us. For instance, do you ever feel like you're not enough? Do you feel like you're not enough for him, for her? Do you feel like you're, you're not enough to your boss and you have to prove yourself again and again and again? Do you feel like you're a giant disappointment to your extended family? And if only you could work harder, be better, they would accept you and love you because then you'd be enough. And so what do you do? You try and you try 
And you try. You work harder. You work harder. You try to be different. You try to cover your insecurities. And yet, no matter how hard you work, you can't shake that feeling. I'm not enough. No matter how much they encourage you, with words of encouragement, you're still sitting there thinking, but I could be better. That's the effects of, the slavery, to, of slavery to sin. Sin has made us go from a, a perfect being to imperfect people. And the taskmaster of sin loves to remind us, you're imperfect. You're not enough. Do you ever feel like in the heat of the moment, you can't help it? That, that you want to keep your patience. You want to not yell but you hit a boiling point and you feel like you can't keep it in and it just comes out. That's the taskmaster of sin barking orders at you. And then you know what the, the taskmaster of sin is really good at? Once you finally erupt and let it out, either through your words or actions, what does the taskmaster of sin do then? He comes and puts the shackles of shame on you and say, I cannot believe you would do that. I cannot believe you would say that. I cannot believe you would, you would do that, think that, say that. And he just entangles you. And no matter how hard you work, no matter how, hard, how much you make up for what you did, no matter how many apologies you say, no matter how much of an effort you make to be better next time, you can't shake it. You can't shake the, the shame that fills you, the guilt that fills you in the quiet moments. Do you ever live and wonder what's the point? There's no hope. What's my purpose? It's monotony of life. The, the kids are grown. The, the grandkids are grown. They all have their own lives, and, and here we are. What's the point? Do you live in fear? Constantly fearing because of look at the world around us. Look how much of a divide there is. Look at all the scary things that could possibly happen to our loved ones, to us. Look at the sicknesses. Look at the diseases. Look at the rapid rate of cancer. There's so much to be afraid of. And that's because of sin. And sin is there reminding you. Death is coming. And you know what? No matter what we do, we can't avoid it. No matter how hard we work, sin has mastery over us, and we can't shake it, we can't run from it, we can't do our own thing, we're stuck. Just like the Israelites were stuck in their slavery to the Egyptians. What God was teaching the people was there is a much deeper slavery here that you need to be freed from. And it's not slavery from a nation. It's slavery to sin. But the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts freed them from the nation of Egypt, but not from the slavery to sin. So how does God do it? 1,500 years later, after the Passover, one of the most joyful moments in all of history happened a baby was born. He was born in Bethlehem, just outside Jerusalem, in a small little town. He wasn't born in a hospital. He wasn't born in a house. He was born in a barn, among the farm animals. He was wrapped in cloths, and he was placed in a manger, in a feeding trough. And then as Jesus' mother Mary and his stepfather Joseph looked down with smiling faces at their brand new baby boy. I wonder if they realized that they were looking at the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. I wonder if they looked at the precious face of that baby and thought, it's me or him. It's me or this baby's blood 
that is going to be shed. Because that's who he was. That's who he is. The Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. You want to be free from sin? You want to be free from your slavery to fear, to depression, to anxiety? It's only through the blood of the Lamb. And that's your second point. The blood of the Lamb will set people free from sins, darkness, and death. That baby boy born grew up And what did we hear John the Baptist say? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1 says what? You were redeemed. You were bought. You were freed. Not by gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect the perfect Passover lamb. Just like Israel was redeemed, freed by the blood of the lamb from Egypt, you and I are freed from sin, death, and the devil through the precious blood of Christ. Just like the lamb or goat had to have be without blemish, without defect, our perfect Savior Jesus never sinned once. He had no defect, no imperfections, no blemishes. He was perfect in every way. And just like that lamb was a sacrifice in the place of the firstborn son, Ephesians chapter 5 says, Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The perfect Passover lamb, when he shed his blood on the cross, what did it do for you? It freed you from your sins. It freed you from the slavery and control of sin. It freed you from sin's death and sin's darkness in your life. What's this mean for you? If you were feeling, if you feel like you're not enough, that's a result of sin. What do we know through the blood of the Lamb? Your sins have been forgiven. Your imperfect imperfections before God have been removed. God sees you as whole, perfect in His sight. If you're feeling guilty and ashamed, what has the blood of the Lamb done? Forgiven your sins. God says you are at peace with Him. If you want to live with hope, how do you live with hope? It's only through the blood of the Lamb because through the blood of the Lamb, sin has been conquered, sin has been paid for, death has been removed. If you want to live at peace on your deathbed, When you're about to die, how do you live in peace? It's only through the blood of the Lamb who promises freedom from death and into the promised land, not of Canaan, but the promised land of heaven with your Lord and Savior. Do you want to live in confidence? It only comes through the blood of the Lamb because through the blood of the Lamb, you're no longer a slave, but a child of God, an heir of His kingdom forever. And it's all through the blood of the Lamb. And I mentioned this one a couple weeks ago, but it's so good. Jesus tells his disciples not to rejoice that the the demons respond, uh, obey them, but instead rejoice that your names are written in heaven. How? Through the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb has set you free. Has set you free from sin's darkness and death to live in peace and hope and joy in the forgiveness of sins. Just like we sang earlier, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We looked at the context. We look at how it applies to today. What does this mean for us now? What, what should we do? Two things. And this is how we're going to close. As, as the Israelites were, were going to leave, part of their instruction was that every year celebrate this Passover feast. Have the lamb, have the, the bitter herbs, have the bread without yeast, and celebrate it every single year. And what was supposed to happen was the dad was supposed to make it for his family, and they were supposed to celebrate as a family unit. And when their kids asked, Dad, why do we do this? 
dad, remind your kids. Why? It's because God saved us from our slavery. With, a mighty, with his mighty act, his mighty arm, he came and delivered us from our slavery to sin. Or uh, to the Egyptians. When Jesus died, what festival were the Jews celebrating in Jerusalem at that time? The Passover. The Passover talking about the deliverance that God brought from slavery to the Egyptians. They were celebrating on the night before Jesus died. He's in the upper room celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And as Jesus is narrating what ha- is, what, why they're doing what they're doing, what does he do? He takes bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, Say, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. He institutes the Lord's Supper to remember the great acts of our God to assure us that we're free, not from a slavery to a nation, but free from the slavery to sin. If you have not received the Lord's Supper here, if you have not celebrated with us, let's meet this week and let's get you celebrating the Lord's Supper with us uh, to remember and be assured we are free from sin. Number two, they were free. The Israelites were freed from their slavery after this. But were they free to do whatever they wanted? No, they were free to be the people of God. Just like Romans chapter 6 said, they were free from slavery to slavery. It just is a matter of who your master is. They were free from, the, from depression, from despair, from no hope, from a, a, a horrible taskmaster, the Egyptians, and now they serve the living, loving God filled with grace and mercy, and they were his children. And the same is true for you and me. We are sla- saved from slavery to sin, to slavery to God to serve him, to worship him, to obey him, and he's a God and master filled with love and mercy and grace for you and me. A, a God so filled with grace that he sent his son to be the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world, to free us. And so let's serve him to the one who loves us, who gave his son for us to be the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Savior, you are the Passover Lamb. It's because your blood has been shed uh, on the cross that we uh, have death passed over us. You pass over us when you come to bring judgment over sin uh, because we have taken refuge in your blood. We thank you for being the sacrifice of God to take away the sins of the world. Uh, It was us or you, and you graciously took our place and shed your blood so that we wouldn't experience hell or death eternal, but we get to live in life eternal with you forever. We thank you for setting us free. Fill us with peace, with joy, and with hope every single day, knowing that we are free from sin and free to serve and worship you forever. In your name we pray. Amen.